Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. I don't think you could be anything other than horrified reading this report. Heartbroken, you know, this is the voices of 2,000 of our staff. So, so this report isn't my report on Azir Afsal's report. This is, this is the report of 2,000 people in the London Fire Brigade. So, yeah, just absolutely horrified. Inexcusable behaviours. Very disappointing as a career firefighter to read that. And what are you going to do about it? Well, the change starts now. It was the reason why we commissioned the report, why I commissioned the report, because we knew there was issues in our culture. So the change has to start now. It begins, I think, most tellingly by putting all of our complaint and investigation services out to a robust set of external experts to take that function on. It means we are, will be the first service in the country to introduce body-worn cameras for our own staff safety and to reassure the public. It means we will be conducting a, a five-year historic case review and where we find people have not met the standards of behaviour we clearly expect in a zero-tolerance culture to this stuff, we will dismiss them. Are you apologetic? Yes, I think I have to apologise to London and Londoners and I have to apologise to those 2,000 people who raised their voice that, that clearly we have not addressed this uh, issue with the energy we needed to in the past. But that is why we commissioned the report and that is why the change starts now. Hey folks, today we're going to start our conversations around the response to the culture review in LFB. Now, on the 25th of November, the London Fire Brigade published the outcome report of the independent culture review. This was led by Nazir Afzal, who is an OBE, and it was commissioned last year by the commissioner with the support of the mayor, Sadiq Khan. Now, a little bit of background on this. Nazir and his team heard the experiences of over 2,000 current and former staff and the public as well, including members of the Grenfell community. The report contains accounts of shockingly poor behaviour and painful experiences over many, many years. So there's so much that we can go into about this and we're going to do a couple of probably follow-up episodes. My big frustration and challenge around this is the way that this has been framed, the lens through which it is being communicated. And there's also a little bit around the timing and around pay reviews that are happening in the UK Fire and Rescue Service. Um, So there's lots of stuff to go into here. Firstly, in this one, we're just going to go into a little bit of the background about the report just to give people some context. Now, the London Fire Brigade Commissioner, Andy Rowe, uh, we're going to go into a little bit of detail around Andy and his background as well, just to give people some context there. He said, today is a very sobering day. There's no place for discrimination, harassment and bullying in the brigade. And from today, it will be completely clear to all staff what behaviour is and isn't acceptable and what the consequences will be. We're going to go into a little bit more about that. Uh, He says he is deeply sorry for the harm that has been caused and he will be fully accountable for improving our culture and he accepts the 23 recommendations that came out of the culture review. Now, we're going to go into the culture review, um, but they have put in some immediate changes, apparently, off the back of it, which, again, we'll go into it in a bit. But from today, the brigade is making immediate changes to provide increased protection for its staff. Anyone accused of discrimination, harassment, or bullying will be suspended following a risk assessment, pending immediate investigation, and dismissed if the accusation is upheld. Um, The report highlighted a lack of confidence in the brigade's current complaints procedure and showed that staff didn't feel safe speaking up. Following the outcome of the review, the brigade is introducing an external complaint service. While internal processes are improved, staff will be able to use the service to report poor behaviour rather than having to report it internally. So let's go into a little bit of background about how this whole review came about. So there's an article from March 2021 in The Guardian where Andy himself uh, speaks about the fears he has in the workplace culture and that they would stop his daughter feeling welcome at some stations. That is a really strong statement in itself. The article speaks about a culture of casual racism and misogyny remains so prevalent within pockets of the London Fire Brigade and saying that the workplace culture may explain the poor progression of women and staff from BAME backgrounds, that's black and minority ethnic backgrounds, to senior positions within the service, according to Andy Rowe. London Fire Brigade Commissioner, who this week, so this is back in March of 21, launched the review, acknowledging the brigade was unresolved problems on race and gender. Now, what was the big tipping point? Because a lot of this comes around that a month before the review started, there was an inquest into the death of Jaden Francois Esprit, who was a trainee firefighter at Wembley Fire Station. Now, Jaden sadly took his own life 
in August of 2020, three weeks after his 21st birthday. And his family were concerned that he'd been bullied because of his race. Now, a fellow trainee that worked with Jaden, Gabriel Iverson, told the King's Cross Coroner's Report in the statement that he felt he was being teased about the food and about his culture and his background. There'd also been some reports saying that he was teased because he was the only black firefighter on his watch, which is not the case, which we'll go into. Now, the coroner said there was insufficient evidence to link race or bullying to the suicide. The coroner highlighted instead the need for greater sensitivity towards employees' mental health. Now, that's one thing we can all agree on, and that is irrespective of race, religion, sex, or anything like that. But Andy Rowe, who took over in January 2022 after his predecessor faced criticism over the handling of the Grenfell fire, said he remained determined to improve the brigade's record on race. He said that Jaden's death poses very tough questions for them as an organization about how they treat young people, how they view difference, and how they genuinely make everyone feel welcome. He said that he doesn't need the inquest to show him that race has been an issue. I've only got to look at our own data. So let's talk a little bit about Jaden Francois Esprit and the tragic details around his death as this was one of the triggers for the review. Now, as I've already said, Jaden was training to be a firefighter at Wembley Fire Station and died in late August. His family feared he was being bullied due to his race and being teased for eating Caribbean food. Now, colleagues of Jaden felt that the 21-year-old was bored and frustrated with his job, but did not think that he was being bullied. Recording a verdict of suicide, the coroner Mary Hassel said that she was concerned that the deterioration of Mr. Francois Esprit's mental health went undetected by those around him. The inquest heard that Jaden had made 16 transfer requests to four stations in London six months before his death. The hearing was told that he'd been advised that his request was unlikely to be granted until he had completed his training workbook, a process that would probably take him about eight months. Now, Jaden's mother alleged that her son was being unfavorably singled out because of his ethnic minority. She told the hearing that he hated working at Wembley Fire Station and that he was being bullied. And they were also told that he was the only black firefighter at the station. And one of his colleagues, Lewis Gunn, told the inquest that he had noticed Mr. Francois Esprit had become more withdrawn within the months before he died. And he added that I knew he didn't feel like it was a busy enough station, which is a common realisation for a lot of firefighters going through training. Station officer Daniel Green said a quarter of the firefighters on Mr. Francois Esprit's watch were not white. He told the inquest to hear it reported that he was the only person of colour on his station. Station Officer Green said he couldn't understand why people would say that. Now we're also just going to take a quick look at the coroner's report which is publicly available on the internet into Jaden's death. And it was sent to the Commissioner of London Fire Brigade from Coroner Hassel. So the investigation and inquest was on the 3rd of September 2020 and commenced an investigation into the death of Jaden, age 21. The investigation concluded at the end of the inquest on the 15th of February and the coroner made the determination of suicide. In the last few weeks of his life, he became withdrawn, including his place of work as a firefighter. He felt isolated, though in reality, he had friends there and was well-liked, as well as being loved by his family. During the course of the inquest, the evidence revealed matters giving rise to concern. In coroner's opinion, there is a risk that future deaths will occur unless action is taken. Unbeknown to those who worked with him at Wembley Fire Station, Jaden's mental well-being was deteriorating significantly in the last few weeks of his life, and it deteriorated to the point where he killed himself. The coroner heard an inquest that London Fire Brigade has quite sophisticated systems in place to support firefighters suffering mental ill health. However, Jaden was not offered the support by London Fire Brigade of, for example, psychological counselling because it was not appreciated that he was so very low. Now, obviously, if firefighters are to be given the best chance of recovering from mental ill health, their difficulties first need to be recognised. The coroner appreciates that it can be difficult to detect that a person may be depressed or exceptionally unhappy Signs may have been subtle and require a nuanced approach. Jaden often complained that he was very bored because Wembley Greenwatch had not been called to many incidents. They heard evidence that the boredom in a new firefight can be quite common. However, they also heard that a complaint of boredom can be a sign of a person with dyslexia avoiding an unpalatable or daunting task. Jaden had dyslexia and was worried that he would not be able to complete his written work in order to become a fully qualified firefighter. Yet the reality was that his station officer was fully aware of his difficulties and had tried to reassure Jaden that he was certainly capable of achieving his goal. Again, a great demonstration of the support that Jaden had locally by his station. Jaden did need extra time, the space to make changes, and a degree of sensitivity that was not always afforded him. On the other hand, he asked for help and was given a mentor, but did not make use of him, so eventually the mentorship ceased. The request for help followed by a refusal of help was not explored. Such an exploration might have led to a great understanding of how Jaden could have been helped. Jaden felt he was being treated unfairly at work and his family 
have formed the view that there was an element of racism there, driven in part by the belief that Jaden was the only non-white person on Wembley Green Watch. Yet the reality was that he joined a watch where a quarter of the firefighters were people of colour. He described being teased about bringing chicken, rice and peas to work to eat, thinking that this teasing was because the food was Caribbean. Looking at this from the outside, chicken, rice and peas seems a dish without obvious world origins. Moreover, the coroner heard about a huge variety of food being brought to work by firefighters, with some even weighing their food before eating. None of this sits easily with a dish of chicken, rice and peas resulting in a racist comment. Jaden's interior life did not always accord with what was going on around him. Most of all, Jaden felt isolated, and yet it was clear to the coroner that there was a lot of affection for him at the fire station. He did not always feel comfortable there. It is not necessarily an easy task to unearth such feelings in a colleague, but if it results in such a tragedy like this being avoided, it's worthwhile doing. So those are some of the chief coroner's reports that again are said to be the big contributing factors to what started this review. Now, the Independent Culture Review of London Fire Brigade that came out in November of 2022 speaks a lot around workplace culture, the LFB morale, it references industrial relations, diversity and inclusion, and effectively paints the firefighters, the frontline staff, as being misogynistic and racist. So now we're going to transition into some bits around the Independent Culture Review, some specific aspects that are in this 92-page document. We're going to try and trim through some of the waffle and pull out some of the key points have been really triggering, especially for some of our frontline firefighters. So over the period of 10 months, a seven-strong team led by Nazir Afzal OBE gathered evidence that people experienced in their working environment and the wider culture that supported this. They did some desktop research. They did online surveys completed by 1,672 members of staff. They did over a dozen focus groups where multiple members of staff representing different departments and interest groups took part in discussions and over 250 interviews with current and previous members of staff. They also did station visits and talked to firefighters on the job to assess workplace culture. Now there's some pretty horrific accounts and some pretty triggering statements within the review speaking about microaggressions, bullying, things around horrential racial abuse. For example, speaking to a black firefighter who had had a noose put around his locker. Statements that they also spoke to a Muslim who was constantly bullied about his religion and had bacon and sausages put in his coat pockets and a terrorist hotline sign posted on his locker. On countless occasions, apparently stories of racial slurs being casually used and were related to the review by people of colour. At its worst, particularly in relation to some Muslim firefighters, it would manifest itself in constant mockery, baiting and bullying, with one firefighter who had been diagnosed with PTSD apparently as a direct result of this. It also states the intolerance didn't solely exist at fire stations. It was revealed that senior figures in the communications team had been sacked and walked off premises after expressing views on race. And also they had looked at certain pieces of data that they believe gave evidence showing that people of colour were disproportionately subject to disciplinary action and less likely to gain promotion. Also a lot of stuff that wasn't just around race. There was apparently a strong evidence of othering. And they'd heard countless accounts of women being subject to abuse from colleagues on a day-to-day basis which they say pointed to a deep-rooted culture of misogyny. The stories of people being groped in training exercises and having to run a daily gauntlet of sexist abuse. Again, frequently euphemized as banter, many were routinely referred to as women or front bottom by colleagues, and more seriously, some were punched and attacked. Some also had to endure the indignity of having photos of them taken without their consent, which were then passed on to colleagues with misogynistic comments written on them. Many were sexually taunted, and one woman, after taking complaints about this, received a video calls from a man exposing his genitalia. Doesn't say whether or not this man is part of the fire brigade or not. And in another case, a senior officer was asked to retire early after sending inappropriate photos on his work phone to women. Some of the most senior leaders in LFB admitted to them that they'd heard many people say that women should not be firefighters at any level. One particularly frustrating and upsetting part of the report is where it states that any close inspection of some of the fire stations shows a watch culture where men sometimes huddle around a screen watching porn, which I just find really difficult to believe and that it wasn't and it isn't reported and dealt with if that is the case. They're saying that the modern fire service still suffers from an image of muscle-bound burly firefighters, which is often at odds with the challenges facing the service. Now, again, I agree that that narrative may be one that's viewed by the public, and they give that example of a Love Island's much criticized fireman challenge, where they see male contestants dressed up as firefighters stripped down and then save the female partners. Again, that's a demonstration of how the public see the fire service. People working within the fire service, in my personal opinion, do not still view the fire service as this big muscle bound, burly firefighter organization. And again, in the review, one borough commander explains that women are often fitter than men. And there has been times when they've taken men off the run because they are not strong enough 
and fail the ladder tests. Ideally, you need a mix of people in the service. The same firefighter stated that it's ironic that male firefighters often claim women aren't up to the job physically and that they're too fragile. And in this person's experience, far too many men are fragile because they're so easily threatened by difference. Now, it's an important statement that says these issues relate to failing HR systems, poor leadership, training and career development systems that are seen as not fit for purpose and need for a better understanding of the employee's mental health. There's stuff in the review about the strategic direction of the brigade. Referencing again the commissioner's public acknowledgement that as a cultural and casual racism and misogyny existed in pockets of LFB, using the benchmark of his young mixed race heritage daughter, that he could not say with confidence that she'd be treated with dignity and respect in every single part of London Fire Brigade. They reference a few culture change strategies around the togetherness strategy, which aims at gold standard inclusion and diversity, but they've said through staff feedbacks that the strategic work is not valued and that it's largely there to keep the leadership busy. They have a Safe to Speak program which was launched in September 2021 and aims to improve confidence in the reporting system. And between September 2021 and March 22, 22 people use the scheme and the majority of the staff using the scheme were uniform. Now that's 22 people out of nearly 6,000 staff. And of those complaints, there was stuff around the recruitment process, inconsistencies around special leave for bereavements, and it gives a little note that it says a few complaints over harassment. Now, there's a big section in the review around Grenfell Tower. It does state that the incident loomed large over this review and has undoubtedly had a seismic impact on the culture of LFB. Staff repeatedly stated that it had taken a toll on their mental health and LFB states that they didn't have the full data on the number of people that left the brigade because of the impact of Grenfell, but they did acknowledge that there had been a number of ill health retirements as a result of it. It stated there's 88 periods of sickness absence recorded as relating to Grenfell Tower and it states that as a result of Grenfell, their counselling and trauma services had 258 direct Grenfell-related referrals. They also recognised the profound impact that Grenfell had on the anger of firefighters who took significant personal risks on the night and then felt the public criticism of the brigade's response personally. One Grenfell community group described the conflict some felt having been rescued from the fire by a service that, in many other ways, had failed them. There's some specific parts of the review relating to leadership, and over the course of the review, they spoke to considerable sample of leaders across the LFB rank, from all grades and ranks up to and including the commissioner. By their own volition, they say that the senior leadership team are all high-performing individuals who have the best interests of their workplace at the forefront of their minds, but they saw a lot of silo working in leadership roles that merely reinforced how isolated senior leaders had become. They were struck by how much micromanagement takes place with people seeking permission to influence those in power rather than seizing the opportunity to influence events as they come their way. In part, this is a confidence issue and LFB believes itself to be a junior department, particularly when compared to the Metropolitan Police, although within the mayor's remit, the senior team said they weren't outwardly concerned that any expenditure over 150k had to be agreed by the City Hall. And apparently this is why senior staff often micromanage their juniors feeling that if they themselves can't be trusted to make big decisions and be held accountable for them, then is it any wonder that those they line manage can be expected to either? They heard several accounts that suggested LFB staff were confused by the leadership style of senior managers. Many were used to a command and control model where rank and status were used to obtain compliance. The pips on the uniform were an absolute determinant of where power lies. However, an equal number of others considered their workplace to be more collegiate and built around teamwork where compliance was obtained by the power of influence and one gets others willingly cooperate and engage. The review identified trust concerns at all levels of leadership. Though there were fewer problems with immediate line managers, the survey showed that over 70% of respondents felt that they were managed satisfactorily or very good. The negative feelings towards leaders tended to increase with seniority and frequently expressed a view that the senior leaders were distant, aloof or hiding in Union Street. Blame was disproportionately heaped on senior management with some claiming they exemplified the bullying culture that stubbornly persisted in some watches and also did not understand diversity. Stating that senior management is where cultural issues lie. Bullying happens from a senior level. One quote detailed in the review from a serving member of LFB says that senior management is where the cultural issues lie. Bullying happens from a senior level. I'm an ex-serving Royal Marine and my senior officers in the Marines were so much better and even though officers, still team players. The brigade, it's all about if your face fits. I've had numerous encounters with senior officers and their helpfulness and knowledge is horrendous. I think watches are the most diverse groups within the brigade 
We are established teams that work well together. The issues arise when senior officers get involved and throw a big stick around as they have to show that they have power. This widened trust gap was a particularly alarming finding and long-serving fire and rescue services staff and operational staff said they felt that over the last 10 years, the leadership has been poor and inconsistent with no real guidance and strategy. It was felt that there has been and continues to be a very poor relationship amongst principal managers, which is openly observed by senior and middle managers. Some of the typical views that were supported were things such as going past my immediate manager, things tend to get lost in the ether, good ideas go nowhere and corporate drivel is spouted. Unfortunately, for all we seem to run like a bad business. Another said that raised concern over performance and behavior of individuals, investigation carried out and then brushed under the carpet by DAC due to optics. Another said my immediate line manager is very supportive and has informed me of intended actions. It is my line manager's manager that prevents action and is the bottleneck for all situations. An overwhelming thing that comes through the report and one of the strongly supported views is that watch-based staff are receptive. It's when you start going above station officers, then it seems they're only in it for tick boxes and looking after each other. Us who wear red t-shirts are just pain numbers and not real emotional human beings who need help. Unless you're liked or you know the right people, you are not helped. And in many cases, my daily work life has been made worse. A constant refrain was that leadership is do as I say, not as I do. The chasm between leadership and firefighters contributed significantly towards the deteriorating workplace culture. This created obvious resentment. In station visits, they heard firefighters condemn the white shirts for not knowing anything about what they do and not getting out of Union Street and getting their hands dirty. It spoke about a culture where trust is openly hemorrhaging and this was further echoed in online responses to the survey. There was also a number of frustrated leaders in the organisation who felt they could not get rid of poor firefighters. Now this is something we speak about on the podcast from time to time, around people being invited into and pitched one version of the life of a firefighter that when they get in, perhaps they can't achieve, perhaps they can't aspire to, or perhaps it's just not what they thought it was going to be. Some of the frustrated leaders in this review said, we need more teeth. How can someone who works for an organisation, for example, that has a zero tolerance for drugs, be on a final written warning when they've failed a medical due to drug taking. This frustration also extended to concerns over the brigade's ability to identify talent and support the most able firefighters. They stated that we have a problem identifying talent for leadership. Why have we got people doing a really good job acting up and they can't pass an interview? There's something wrong. And then you get really good firefighters passing all their exams and being offered a promotion that's miles away and unsuitable for them and their family. They turn it down and they are told not to go for promotion again, so they leave. Some watches felt that leadership on fire stations was generally good. However, from station commander and above, it's poor. There are very few role models that reflect good leadership in all aspects of the managerial role. The fact that leadership is so inconsistent may well be connected to the fact that the culture of the organization is not a key performance indicator, which means it's not measured or valued. Neither is the importance of listening or empathy. There were multiple complaints about leaders and HR lacking people skills, which are not recognized in any training. One thing that comes through in the review is when it comes to workplace culture, the heart of the LFB is a family culture built on trust and togetherness. This is similar in many ways to the army. However, it can be viewed as a pack mentality which will work for some and not for others. To belong to a fire station, you have to earn your stripes, prove yourself and earn the team's trust. The culture is dependent on the watch and you must make it work. The watch leader is crucial in setting the tone and middle managers are seen as key to creating a positive culture but appear to have the most challenging role with limited support. Addressing the watch culture must be a priority for London. A very specific point that doesn't seem to make it through to any of the news reports starts on page 28. It says that most participants found the place they work to be a supportive and friendly environment, but they knew of other watches and teams where they would not want to work. Similarly, many examples were given of good managers they have worked with who are supportive and where they enjoyed working for many years. However, this could easily change with a new manager or being moved to another watch or team. Now, the culture on a fire station was demonstrably different to that of an office-based environment. Some stated that the reason was that the values of the organization could be expressed differently due to the differences in the roles, despite working for the same organization. An example of this was frequently discussed as the role of the mess that you find on any fire station. It was widely recognized as being the focal point of any station and where a lot of interactions and bonding traditionally occurred. Friendships are often formed here. Issues can be raised in an informal manner and contribute good working relationships and frank discussions are held to nip things in the bud and prevent potential conflicts from escalating. The majority of contributors to these discussions considered the mess to be a productive place. However, many recognize that the environment is not always a pleasant experience, and this often depended on the culture of a particular watch. Now, an important thing to recognize is that there are 103 fire stations and 412 watches. 
Each watch can be completely different in regard to common practices, including behavior, management styles, and how people respond. Now we're going to look at some of the quotes that they chose to pull out and put into this report, both from a mix of operational and non-operational staff. One says that it's mostly positive. People like working here. It does feel like a family. In fact, I would go so far as to say people stay longer because of the relationships with colleagues. Another states the most positive is the position and commitment for the work and what they do as a family type environment and that people talk about a lot. However, they did think that this is a strength that becomes overplayed. The family environment has downsides. Relationships are too strong, which reduces people's ability to be objective and enhances unconscious bias. People are almost too committed to their work in the brigade, driving some quite emotional personal responses to things and ultimately making it difficult to change. Working as part of a watch, eating, sleeping, training and saving lives of people is a common purpose and objective is very rewarding. However, one poor example of the culture is from one of the individuals who states, I still feel I am treated differently either as a woman or as non-operational. I was harassed by my team leader and was told by management not to speak about it. I felt like a troublemaker for making a complaint. Now again, despite the fact a lot of the news reporting frames the firefighters of London Fire Brigade as this sexist and misogynist environment, this is another example here of a female non-operational member of staff having an issue with their team leader. So this is not a firefighter. Some typical comments from firefighters were surveyed on the mess, saying that there's no rank in the mess. It's a place of free speech and a bit of banter is good, providing you respect each other. Traditionally, we all sit and eat together and regardless of whether you're part of the mess, you can bring your own food in. It brings us all together as a team. It might be the only time when we are all associating with each other, which is good. A case study that they use relating to culture is around North Kensington Fire Station, which is located on Labrook Grove and close to Grenfell Tower itself. It's widely recognised as a supportive station with a strong and diverse culture. It's got a long waiting list for firefighters and officers who want to be stationed there. Now, when the review met with Greenwatch, some of the reasons for this stated that their view is that a good watch is a busy watch. They always find a reason to do stuff. They have an attitude that makes people want to come into work. They like being at work and sometimes even when they're on leave, they're always wondering what is happening and can't wait to get back. They enjoy each other's company and serving the community. They have in the past had two watch members transfer to another station so they could be closer to their homes, but within months they transferred back. They miss the professionalism and the community engagement that all pride themselves on. There is also a very close network of staff on the station and retired members still meet up regularly and bond with old and new members. When they spoke about the mess, they said you have to treat the station almost like your own brigade. What they mean is they can only really influence their own watch, station, regardless of what is happening in the wider LFB. On their watch and on the station probably, there is a long-standing expectation to follow the reputation that has existed from those that have served before them. It's always been held in high regard and that's why people wait years to get a chance to serve there. Everything they do they feel starts in the mess. Friendships, meaningful discussions about LFB and even including real personal discussions where you can open up in a supportive environment. It's a place of sanctuary and a safe place where you are supported that can make real working relationships that last long after they've retired. They say they have a diverse team, not just in terms of personal characteristics, but holding different views as well. Any subject can be discussed because they believe they often learn something from others. Watch members frequently raise things in their personal life as well as things that happen them into the local community. However, as a measure of how patchy good practices are, One member of a particularly supportive watch was quick to note that he would not want to be on another watch on the same station. He said it's like walking into the lion's den and there seemed to be no rules or respect. They heard plenty of examples of extreme bullying that took place on watches and some managers said they had been fortunate to get through the experience. There were fights and someone nearly broke their legs. One said they'd been urinated on, headbutted and cold water poured over them. One manager states in the report that they have had to raise issues of poor or underperformance of staff and this has on some occasions resulted in being accused of bullying and harassment, although no case of bullying and harassment has ever been founded to be proven against them, as they work within the guidance and ensure that they are fair to their staff. During these periods, the individual said they were not supported, and when they raised concerns of poor or underperformance of others with managers, there is a reluctance to act, which provides inconsistency in response and creates teams that have different levels of operating, depending on if poor performance is addressed or ignored. It says that ultimately, generally, LFB managers do not like difficult conversations or more importantly, do not like the amount of work that comes from addressing poor performance. This individual believes that this is one of the main reasons that unhealthy cultures start within teams, departments and stations when it is unaddressed by the leaders. When individuals are asked why bullying harassment 
and such behaviours were allowed to occur. With all the policies, training and structures that are apparently in place, some of the responses simply said that it's poor training. In fact, no real meaningful realistic training for managers or staff in regard to managing people. They said that equality and diversity awareness training is a tick box exercise which no one can even remember they last did. Compared to other professional organisations, they said they are rubbish at dealing with bullying in any form, even if you're a white male, let alone being a woman, gay, black or just different. It is believed that LFB do not invest enough in their supervisory managers and middle managers. You'd only get out what you put in. In the review, it speaks about a variety of issues, including nepotism. They say that nepotism is a problem and the issue of predominantly white officers retiring and then returning was frowned upon. It's favoritism and never favours people of colour. Similarly, the issue of intermarriages was also raised in the same breath as it amounts to favoritism and will always lead to rapid promotion for those that know others in the service. In the review, it states that only brave submit grievances. People have frequently resigned because of the way they have been treated by LFB, and LFB is losing talent because of the way it treats people. It also states that soft skills are not valued or taught. Ironically, staff are expected to use them when they engage with the communities but have a very poor people skills. It says that HR is at fault for ensuring that staff do not have a sense of identity or belonging. A union official said that HR treats staff as just statistics and that it is not a people-focused department. The brigade talks about things such as transformation strategies and that they are divorced from the realities of staff and too high of a level. The review states that it's so high level that nobody else even knows what a transform LFB would even look like. The unions believe that LFB is sitting on a mental health time bomb, where there is a lot of undiagnosed PTSD and that they need to rescue ourselves before we rescue others. A big issue relating to pay, especially in a place like London, is that most individuals in LFB can't afford to live in London and that 40% of the staff have second jobs. Now, I personally think it's probably higher than that and that this is going to get worse. New trainees are left with £1,476 a month, which living in London barely covers their living accommodation, never mind food or anything else. This is another reason why it shows why young people are actually prepared to walk out the job. People used to stick around even if they believed they were badly treated. People are now prepared to walk out and this will lead to a massive retention problem. The next bit's a really interesting one for me, especially as it speaks about people services and recruitment. Now that department's responsible for the employee's journey in LFB from recruitment, selection and induction. They also cover things like performance management, employee relations, equality, diversity, inclusion, discipline, grievances, and termination. In interviews that featured in the review, criticism centered on the fact that people's services was ineffective, inefficient, slow, and people were not always sure what they even do. Staff in the wider organization did not know what people's services did, and they were accused of not understanding the world of firefighters and failing to take a lead on things like well-being. There was a fierce criticism that the department enabled non-transparent recruitment processes and was unfair, rooted in cronyism. A quote states that there's no point asking people services for help, because they are seen as in cahoots with the managers and do what they say. They're not objective or focused on your well-being, they're here to punish you. Another said, they've been aware of issues around unfair treatment and bias towards all staff groups, and failed to monitor and put systems in place to protect people. Some of the statements included, I raised concerns with HR and line manager regarding the stress it was causing me being placed on courses on off-duty days to which it was ignored and threatened with the discipline. There's some interesting stuff in the examples in diversity and inclusion section. Now, some of the comments include that everyone is equal, all part of the same family. But the more the brigade tries to push diversity and inclusion down people's throats, the more divisive it could potentially become. People believe that LFB discriminates against average white males within the organisation. The minority seem to be catered for. We need to stop creating sections and dividing people into minority. As long as the person next to you can do the job, who cares what gender or race they are? While management is broadly committed to serving the needs of all employees, many individuals believe that some groups are allowed to get away with flawed behaviour due to a sense that it is easier to bypass them than take them on. This can be due to a mixture of union links, time in service or knowing the right people. This individual is a working class white male and they don't feel important. There's also some really interesting stuff in the review around mental health and well-being. Now, in the course of the interviews, they heard a considerable anger from some firefighters over the loss of colleagues to suicide. This is something we've covered a lot on the podcast. And they felt more should be done to highlight these deaths and prevent others from taking their life. As a result of the conversations, they asked the brigade for information they held on firefighters who have taken their own life in the past five years. But they acknowledged that prior to 2020, they didn't collect the cause of death. And it was pointed out that coroner's reports can be inconclusive which apparently makes it hard for LFB to provide clear figures, which is understandable. Similarly, they had no data on members of staff who had attempted to take their life. They were, however, able to confirm that in the last five years, six members of LFB staff have committed suicide. 
All of these individuals were male and three of the six were white. One was white other and one was white, black, Afro-Caribbean and one was black, Afro-Caribbean. One declared a disability, five declared as heterosexual and one did not provide data on their sexuality. There's a lot of information and reviews from individuals that have suffered with their mental health that's included in the report. I'd strongly encourage people to go over and take a look. There's also a big section of the review around progression and professional development within which it shows that almost 40% of respondents said that their career in LFB had failed to meet their expectations. When they were asked about why this is the case, 13% said they had not benefited from a coach or a mentor and they had not received effective training or development programs. However, one of the biggest problems, and 18% of people said that they were not confident in the fairness and transparency of the career progression process. Now, as always, is the big aspect that concludes the review to this, but ultimately it says that culture begins at the top. And it has to be said that the commissioner is seen as part of the solution, but considered by many to be an isolated figure who is not wholly supported by those around him. Now, if you want to go over and take a look, there's a bunch of recommendations that they put in as part of it. And we are going to put together some subsequent episodes where we speak to both serving and retired members of LFB about their thoughts on the review. Now, the desire of this episode was to give you an indication as to what's been going on in the review. Hopefully, you've been able to draw some insights from it. It is a 92-page document, and we have skirted through many aspects of it. So please jump in the notes below and take a read of it yourself. And we look forward to hearing the views of serving and retired members from LFB. Thanks for coming back to the podcast. This was a bit of a troll through this one today. So we look forward to catching up with you soon. Look after yourselves and we'll see you there. The Firefighters Podcast is a global podcast seeking to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operators. Through a series of wide ranging conversations celebrating those within our sector, we seek to encourage and support this incredible group of people. It's brought to you by myself, Operational Firefighter, Pete Wakefield, and I speak with individuals from all walks of life who I sincerely believe can add value to or develop those who have chosen this life path. Please support your emergency services wherever you are in the world. And thank you for listening.